This video is supported by Brilliant.org. We like to think that history is an unbroken line of innovation and advancement, but in fact these things rise and fall and sometimes there are huge leaps that have just happened too early to make a difference. Archaeologists and historians have found numerous accounts of devices and technologies that were just way ahead of their time, employing ideas that would take the rest of the world thousands of years to rediscover. Some of them made a meaningful impact on the ancient world, some of them were so forgotten by time that they're a total mystery to us now. But they all kind of force us to rethink what we know about the past and speculate about what could have been. And here's five of them. First up is an ancient steam engine. The invention of the steam engine marked a turning point in human history. Before the steam engine, all work was done by human or animal labor, and there was only so much that you could do, and progress was stalled. But with the advent of the combustion engine, first with steam and later with petroleum, we were able to mechanize work, and at that point, all bets were off. The modern steam engine was invented in 1698 by Thomas Savory, although it would take another hundred years or so for that to become ubiquitous technology, but once it did, it changed the world and spurred on the Industrial Revolution. Just imagine if that technology was invented 2,000 years ago. Because guess what? It kinda was. Huron of Alexandria, also known as Hero, was a mathematician and engineer in the first century AD, and among other things, he invented the first windmill, the first pipe organ, and yes, a steam engine. Called the Yala Pile, it was a radial steam engine that consisted of a boiler with two pipes that led up to a sphere with two tip jets or nozzles facing in opposite directions. Then a fire was lit under the cauldron, which made the water evaporate, steam rose up through the pipes into the rotating chamber, which spun at dazzling speed. Sadly, the Yala Pile was never considered anything more than just a novelty, a doohickey if you will. It was uh, something he used to entertain the king and the court, some even considered it sort of a kid's toy. Why didn't they see its potential? Why didn't this spur on an ancient industrial revolution? Where's my jetpack? Well, for one reason the device spins nicely, but it doesn't really generate a lot of torque, so it's not very useful as a source of power. But even if they were able to make it into a source of power, fuel would be an issue. Keep in mind, this was long before they knew about coal. The only source of fuel that they had was wood. And this was Alexandria, Egypt. Not exactly in the middle of a rainforest. Also, you've got to keep in mind that manual labor back then was done by slaves, and as awful as this sounds, slaves were kind of expendable to them, so they just didn't see a need to automate anything. And besides, the lack of power that this thing put out, actually, the amount of slave labor required just to keep the thing fueled would be more than you would be getting out of the engine, so it just made more sense to have the slave do whatever labor the engine could do. Just one more way that slavery blocked the progress of the human race. It could also be argued that 1700 years later, when the Industrial Revolution got its start, we were already kind of primed for understanding that type of power because we had mastered wind, mills and water mills and we were able to you know use that whereas back in the ancient world they didn't have that understanding already so they had no way of making that connection next up is the baghdad battery this one is controversial to say the least the baghdad battery was a clay jar found near the village of kajit rabu near baghdad in the 1930s it was dated to sometime between 250 BCE and 250 CE, also known as the Parthian period. Now clay jars from that time period are all over the place. That was pretty much the vessel they used to store pretty much anything from liquids like wine and vinegar to scrolls to keep them safe from the environment. But this particular jar was unusual. It featured an asphalt stopper at the top through which there was a length of iron bar. And on the inside of the jar, the iron bar was surrounded by a copper cylinder and the inside of the jar was covered with an acidic resin. And this led the German anthropologist Wilhelm Koenig to suppose that maybe it was an ancient battery, a galvanic cell that they could use to do electroplating, a technique that wasn't possible until the 1840s. It's not the craziest idea if you look at the construction of it, if you filled it with some kind of electrolyte like uh, grape juice, lemon juice, or vinegar, something like that, you could conceivably get some kind of electricity out of it. In fact, the Mythbusters built the recreation of it and they were able to get 1.1 volts out of it. And that's cool but it's not a lot. You would need two of these to run a digital watch. So the only way these batteries could really be useful is if you strung a whole bunch of them together, which doesn't seem possible because there was only one of them that was found, and they also didn't find any wires or connecting devices that would have made that possible. Another theory is that they could use this to elicit sort of a religious experience, like they would connect this battery to a statue, a metal statue featuring an idol of a, a god that somebody wanted to connect with, and when they touched it they would feel that jolt and it would be like them connecting with the god of the statue. Or it might have been used in a medicinal sense. They could have felt that that tiny electrical jolt had some kind of healing properties. Or maybe it was just a curiosity like the Yala Pile, just a, an experiment that somebody came up with that they didn't really understand. Or it's always possible it was just another clay pot that happened to be constructed differently 
and has been completely misunderstood. Basically, we have no way of knowing if they had any idea what this battery could do, why it did what it did, or if they used it for anything at all. By the way, just to add a little coda to this story, if you'd like to go see the Baghdad battery in person, uh, you can't, because nobody knows where it is. It was actually looted from the National Museum in 2003 when the U.S. invaded Baghdad and has never been seen since. This thing just can't stop giving us mysteries to solve. Next up is Damascus Steel. Around the year 1095, Europe got all crusade -y. The Catholic Church under Pope Urban II sent waves of soldiers to the Holy Land to try to reclaim it from the Muslims that currently occupied it. When they got there, they found themselves fighting against soldiers using the most remarkable steel they'd ever seen in their lives. And they called it Damascus Steel. It was said to have almost mythical properties. It could slice a feather in half in midair, but was still strong enough to run through somebody's armor like it was aluminum foil. And it was also beautiful. It was like made of all these wavy, dark and light patterns all over it. They named it Damascus steel because they first encountered it in Syria, but it's actually made out of a type of steel that comes from India called Wootz. The armors that forged Damascus steel, they kept the secret of how they made it very close to their chest. Nobody knows exactly how they took this Wootz steel from India and transformed it into Damascus steel. There are some things that we know. Some sound more like legend than others. The steel was made strong by repeatedly heating it and then quenching it in some kind of liquid. Legends say that they quenched it in dragon's blood, because of course they did. Some said that they quenched it in the urine of a red-headed boy. And then others said that you had to use three-day-old urine from a three-year-old goat that had been eating nothing but ferns. If you ask me, that was just a prank that some Syrian was playing on the Crusaders. But the most metal version says that they quenched the sword by thrusting it into the body of a muscular slave, and then the strength of that slave would transfer into the steel. Damn, son. Studies by modern scientists have concluded that the carbon content in Damascus steel was actually higher than most types of steel, so it's thought that it was forged with charcoal and wood ash. All this extra carbon, when forged with a moderate temperature around 1700 degrees Fahrenheit, would turn into carbide, which basically mated three atoms of iron to one atom of carbon. This gave it great strength, but not enough for it to be brittle. Now, there are some modern processes that have been able to sort of emulate Damascus steel, but we're still not exactly sure how they did it back then with their technology. There are some pieces of Damascus steel, some original Damascus steel laying around, but they are very rare and expensive. Number four is Greek fire. In 1942 at Harvard University, chemist Louis Pfizer led a team working for the United States Chemical Warfare Division to help come up with new and innovative ways to kill people with science. They came up with an incendiary substance that burned like gasoline, but was sticky and gooey and stuck to whatever you flung it on. It was like glue from hell. It was a combination of fuel and a gelling substance made up of co-precipitated salt, naphthenic, and palmitic acids, also known as napalm. It was first used in World War II, but really came into its own during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. This was an innovation in human warfare, but it wasn't the first time the world had seen it. Because in the year 762, the Byzantine people of the city of Constantinople came under siege by Arab forces run by the Umayyad Caliphate. And a couple of years into this siege, the Arab naval blockade was suddenly surprised to see a whole bunch of boats floating toward them. So they moved in to engage the Byzantine boats, and when they did, the Byzantines opened up a can of whoop ass. A stream of unholy fire shot out of the Byzantine ships and torched the Arabs, something they had never seen before. They had no idea what they were dealing with here. Witnesses said that it actually set the air on fire. Even jumping in the water wasn't an escape because this stuff burned on the top of the water, which means it was impossible to put it out. It was an absolute rout of the naval blockade, which finally ended the siege and put an end to the war, temporarily. This insane weapon became known as the Greek fire because the Byzantines were the descendants of the Greeks. And to this day, nobody knows how they did it. It continued to be used by the Byzantines for a couple of centuries, and they even figured out how to make grenades out of it so they could use it in land battles. And eventually their enemies did figure out some ways to actually put out this fire. It usually involves sand, vinegar, and old urine. So basically the Byzantines forced their enemies to carry old urine with them on their boats. That's just trolling level 1,000. Some of the ingredients that were thought to be used in the Greek fire were petroleum, lime, nitre, and sulfur, and it was actually able to be pumped and aimed with one hand. But eventually the secrets of the Greek fire and the tactics that involved it were lost to history and not rediscovered until the 20th century. So the world got to experience a nice millennia there without people getting incinerated alive by flaming gak. And last but not least is the Antikythera mechanism. The island of Antikythera in Greece, also pronounced Antikythera sometimes, was a jagged little island made up of jagged coral reefs and jagged volcanic outcrops where a very non-jagged boat could meet a very jagged end. And I just broke the world record for the number of times where jagged is used in one sentence. Nailed it. 
So it wasn't too much of a surprise in 1902 when a fisherman was diving for sponges and found the remains of an old ship that had run aground. The ship was determined to be from about 70 BCE and actually contained a treasure trove of statues and art that were in really good condition. But amongst all the naked stone people was a weird little device full of gears and gadgets that they'd never seen anything like before and it became known as the Antikythera Mechanism. It was just this mass of corroded bronze gears that fit inside the remains of a wooden box that was about 34 by 19 by 9 centimeters, and it's completely confounded archaeologists for the better part of a century. Some early researchers thought that it might have been an early analog computer, but that was mostly blown off because that was just way too advanced for that time period. It was dated to be around a generation of when the ship wrecked, which was 70 BCE, although some people put it all the way back to 250 BCE. But with more research, including a high resolution X-ray tomography scan that gave us the look at the inner workings that we'd never seen before, the prevailing wisdom changed and yeah, it was a computer. The device contains 37 gears used to trace the motion of the moon, planets, and stars through the zodiac, predicts solar eclipses, and even factors in the irregular orbit of the moon, taking account of the different speed of the moon through the perigree and the apogee. They've also discovered a back face that actually kept track of the Olympic Games. It worked on a geocentric model of the solar system, which was the prevailing wisdom at the time, and operated on both calyptic and metonic calendars, which work on 76-year and 19-year cycles, respectively. These were early calendars that were created in Athens around 300 BCE. What's interesting about this device, well, one of the things that's interesting about this device, is that it was the only one that was found, so we don't know whether or not this was an actual tool used by sailors for navigation, or if it was just a novelty like other things on this list. The writer Cicero actually mentioned a uh, device similar to this in some of his writings, but this was the only one that was ever found. But one thing is clear, this level of accuracy and complexity is something that was completely lost to history and not rediscovered until the master European clockmakers in the 14th century. So how did we lose these things? How does progress in technology come to a screeching halt? Or maybe the better question is, how does technology evolve in the first place? How did electricity, steam locomotion, and mechanization all come together at the same time to create the Industrial Revolution, and why didn't those dots connect back in the ancient world? We look back on history, and all of this seems inevitable, but it wasn't. Little pockets of innovation and technology bubbled up all over the place throughout history, but they never came together to really change things. Maybe in the case of the last couple hundred years, we just got extraordinarily lucky. Although I'd argue that luck had little to do with it because there was another revolution that took place that made all these others come together, and that was a revolution of the mind, the Enlightenment. Science as a process that we use to discover the truth is only something that really took root around the 18th century, really getting started around 1685. But it was only because we had this foundation of the scientific process and peer review that all these different innovations were able to come together to start up the Industrial Revolution, which led to the Computer Revolution, to bring us to where we are right now, only 300 years later. It's heartbreaking in a way. You know, what, what if we had gotten this lucky 2,000 years ago? What, what if the Enlightenment had occurred around 100 BCE and then had a little Industrial Revolution around the year 100 and then computers came about in the year 300? I mean, where would we be now? Like literally, what planet would we be on? It's an interesting thought exercise. Tell me what you think in the comments. Of course, we can't go back and change that. All we can do is just look forward and do what we can to keep all the technological progress we've made from going away. We like to think that we've come too far, that this couldn't possibly happen to us, but they thought that too. So stay smart, stay sharp, don't let the powers that be turn us against each other, and just keep moving forward. One way to stay sharp is to hone your problem-solving skills at Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a learning platform with a twist. Instead of flexing your memory by throwing facts and figures at you, it actually flexes your critical thinking skills by walking you through problems step by step so you can figure it out yourself. This is way more powerful and applicable because not only are you going to be more likely to remember it because you figured it out yourself, but you're also building problem-solving skills that you can use in other areas of your life. It's really amazing as you use the platform how ideas and concepts that maybe you've never quite understood or maybe never even thought about just kind of suddenly come online in your head. It's like adding a whole new layer of understanding to the world that you didn't know was there. One place to start might be their Joy of Problem Solving course that combines creativity, lateral thinking, and mathematical skill to solve geometry puzzles and even tell if somebody's lying to you. That seems like a handy skill in real life. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe and get access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers to get a head start and the first 295 people who sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses get 20% off your subscription for life. All you have to do is throw my name on it. You're welcome. So go check it out, brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe, links in the description.
I want to thank Brilliant for their support of this channel, and I also want to thank the answer files on Patreon who are helping keep the lights on around here. Your support means the world to me. Uh, we have some new people that have joined. I want to give them a shout out real quick. We got Sam Rossman, Vincent Siaska, uh, Marcus Shabeska, <laughs> Matthew Rick, Tito Weissenberger, Jared Alexander, Flat Earth Equals Dumb. Nice. Uh, Courtney McKenzie, Adam Atkinson, Jeff, Michael S. Wade, Brian Back, Craig Borman, Michelle Curley, Jean-Luc Chanel, Art Hashik, David Britt, Sanders Trejo, Alex Smith, Barry Field, Mark Zabo, Jonathan Boten, uh, Lord Grebnovs, Frost X Moritz, I think I'm saying that right, uh, Cameron Wheeler, Jack Andropaz, and Andre Corral. Thank you guys so much. It really means the world to me. If you would like to join them, get access to behind the scenes stuff, uh, secret perks and all kinds of cool things, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. You might like those as well. And if you like those, uh, maybe hit subscribe because you can catch all my new videos when they come up every Monday. All right, that's all for today. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.